Okay, so uh, let's kick off this, uh, this webinar. So the uh, topic of today are innovations for smallholder uh, finance. Um, my name is Iris van der Velden, Director for Learning and Innovation at IDH. And um, we're also uh, working together with DIFIT and the Bilman in the Gates Foundation on uh, FarmFit. And uh, we're, we're co-hosting this uh, webinar from the FarmFit perspective as well. Um, Today I'm here together with Emilio Hernandez and Peter McConaughey. Emilio, can you shortly introduce yourself? Hello everybody, a pleasure to be here. I'm Emilio Hernandez uh, from CGAP, the consultant group to assist the poor. Thanks, Peter, over to you. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter McConaughey. I work as a policy advisor at the UNSGSA which is the United Nations Secretary General, Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development Office. Please, very pleased to be here, thank you. Thanks, so uh, what we're going to do in the coming uh, 75 minutes is uh, we would uh, like to give you a short um, introduction on the Agricultural Finance Working Group that has been pulled together by uh, UNSGSA um, and introduce our panelists that we have online that you also can see uh, uh, today. Then Emilio will share some of the key highlights from the action report that we recently launched. Uh, we will then facilitate a discussion with our panelists and then we are keen to allow you to have more interaction with those panelists by um, creating uh, breakout rooms where uh, there can be questions to the participants directly. So the last 30 minutes of this webinar will be in separate breakout rooms. We will share all the relevant details with you the moment that we finish the discussion uh, with the panelists. So let me start by introducing the, uh, the, the panelists uh, uh, um, to you. Um, so we have the pleasure to have three of the working group members uh, being uh, present today in this webinar. So our first panelist is Laura McKinsey. Uh, she's a senior vice president um, for global prepaid and financial inclusion at MasterCard. And she's responsible for developing, executing um, the global product strategy for MasterCard's core prepaid products. And in addition to that, she's driving product solutions to deliver MasterCard's financial inclusion commitment to the World Bank. Um, and prior to this role, she spent 12 years leading MasterCard's U.S. merchant acceptance for core merchant verticals. And uh, uh, nice to know that Laura uh, started her career in fashion, so in a to totally different uh, sector. So as a second panelist, we are pleased to have uh, with us Purva Pandya. And Purva is leading the ETG Pharma Foundation, which is the non-profit wing of one of uh, Africa's largest and fastest growing agricultural conglomerates uh, uh, export training group, ETG. Um, she helped to establish the foundation and she's overseeing the foundation's work in six countries. She's also actively engaged in multiple global platforms uh, to create uh, public-private partnerships focusing on sustainable rural finance. And last not, but not least, we're, we're happy to also have uh, a man in our panel. So we're happy to have uh, Daniele Tricarico with us, who is the Director of Insights for GSMA. And GSMA is a global association of the mobile industry, uh, uniting uh, more than 750 uh, operators um, with over 350 companies. And he, um, uh, Daniele and his group is uh, focusing on creating industry analysis and intelligence. And before um, Daniela joined GSMA, he was a telecom analyst. So warm welcome to our panelists. Uh, great to have you all uh, with us. Um, then let me go to the back, a little bit more of the background of this working group. So there is this 170 billion um, financing gap that smallholder farmers and SMEs are facing. And this gap probably even got, got worse due to COVID-19, right? So there are several webinars that show that this finance, that smallholder farmers and SMEs are heavily affected in, with, in, in several ways due to COVID-19. Um, so this finance gap is, is, is a major thing. And um, thanks to Queen Maxima with her secretariat, UNSGSA, she took the initiative 
to look at what are alternatives for smallholder agriculture finance. Can we actually leverage non-financial delivery channels? So can we go out of the box and look beyond financial institutions to see what they can actually do in uh, working on this finance gap? Um, CCAP and IDH were uh, asked and pleased to accept a role of, of chairing this working group. Uh, we have a nice group of uh, different type of companies and organizations involved in the working group. So uh, we have Ecom and ETG as agribusinesses working in the working group, uh, Rabobank and IFC as uh, financial players, um, IFAT as a, a multilateral, Mastercard as a payment company and uh, GSMA representing the mobile industry and Tristan Campina working in, in Derry. So when we started this working group in mid 2018, uh, with the ask from the Secretariat of the Queen, can we look at our own experiences and, um, on, and, and see what kind of opportunities do we see if we are working together in a way, and if we would be working together in a way that we currently are not doing, and what kind of trends are then emerging? So the first action of this working group was to really dig into our own experiences, looking at data-driven evidence to see what are key trends and recommendations that we actually can share with a broader group. So the first output of this group is this action report where Peter will also say a few more words on later on. And we said, okay, of course it's nice for this working group to put together our insights and hopefully share those with our larger public, but let's also get into action. So another output of this working group is that we got to a collaborative pilot with some uh, of the key working group members in Kenya. And Emilio will tell you a little bit later on, on the details of this uh, uh, pilot. Um, then, um, as said, uh, there's this need for this innovative partnerships and, and non-financial delivery channels because the traditional ch uh, channels often are not uh, working due to high costs, uh, high risks. We do see that agribusinesses are stepping in, and uh, but they're mostly stepping in on, on more short-term finance, and for them alone, it won't be feasible to to, fi to to fill the gap. So what's new about what we will share today is that we're looking to break silos, to share data, and partnerships, of course, in itself are not new, but the way we are organizing the partnerships has some innovative elements. Peter, can you give a few words on the, the report that we uh, released a couple of uh, weeks ago? Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, really pleased to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, from the UNSGSA perspective, um, one of our core mandates is really to advance financial inclusion and raise the profile of key uh, policy and reform um, agendas um, in priority countries and across priority um, sectors. Um, and so uh, along with our sector work, um, uh, small smallholder um, farming and agricultural finance is, is one of these key priorities. So, you know, we're quite proud of this work and, and it's really a testament um, to Iris, uh, your, your leadership over at IDH, as well as Emilio, um, you know, the hard persistent work uh, and leadership um, from the CGAP side. So, so thank you very much. Um, you know, we know that um, agricultural production must increase, um, you know, as much as 70% to feed a projected 9.1 billion people uh, by 2050. Um, and, and at the same time, we do know that um, most recently, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, smallholder farmers um, are particularly affected uh, through border closures, market closures, decreases in productivity, declines in crop production. Um, we also know that um, more broadly, uh, finance is quite constrained um, for smallholder farmers at the household level with financial inclusion levels being lower um, than um, a general population, but also um, um, that, um, as Iris alluded to, uh, the need for a, your productive credit for expansion is quite, um, can, can be quite constrained. Um, uh, what the working group focused on is this element of innovation, as was pointed out, um, and, and this is really what um, uh, the focus of the group uh, is, um, um, and that is one of the key elements that's emerging as, as, as new. So uh, the use of digital technology, um, uh, advances in irrigation, advances in connectivity across supply chains. Um, this is um, uh, some of the key elements that um, 
will propel um, agricultural finance forward um, and also um, create a certain cause for optimism. Um, so uh, I'll stop there and, and, and maybe just add that uh, we, we intend to continue the working group as well. So beyond the dissemination of this report, um, so we'll be using this, this webinar today as well as the one next week um, that's focused, um, has public sector and um, multilateral panelists um, to sort of prioritize and, and, and action um, uh, list moving forward. So, so um, the discussion um, um, uh, will be very useful in terms of informing the agenda of the working group and also really trying to raise up the two, three key priorities that we need to take moving forward and also the related advocacy messages uh, that Her Majesty Queen Maxima um, can raise to, to sort of the high level decision makers, um, either at a country level or in global uh, forums. So thanks very much for the opportunity to say a few words. Over. Thanks, Peter. Over to you, Emilia, to get us through the key insights of the, of the report. Thank you very much. Um, a pleasure. So um, very much in the spirit of the working group, we have really seen and monitor global trends around new ways of doing agricultural finance and rural finance in general. And these new ways really are very much related on leveraging on digital technology to create new types of more private-private partnerships between industries that traditionally have not worked together. So what we are seeing really is an increasing trend of um, these partners coming together, uh, which include agribusinesses, banks, payment companies, mobile network operators, fintech companies, fast moving consumer good companies, and even e-commerce firms, right? And all of these businesses have been undergoing a very rapid digitization process to increase efficiency in their own operations. But at the same time, that has really led way to facilitate the integration of systems and processes with one another in a way that can greatly increase the value of uh, financial services, of, of the services they offer to customers and improve very importantly, the unit economics of delivering these services in more remote rural areas, which has always been uh, a barrier um, for providers um, to operate in, 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 in rural areas, right? So maybe next, next slide, please. So uh, now what these partnerships really are doing are in a way um, increasing the efficiency and quality of the financial services, the risk assessments and the value chain transactions uh, in their operations by pooling various capacities and knowledge of the different cross industry partners. Um, this pooling of knowledge, data, and capacity in, in delivery channels really helps see the ultimate rural customer, the smallholder farmer, or the agricultural small and medium enterprises in a more holistic manner. Because you can appreciate not only a, a specific dimension of the lives, be it farming, be it trading, uh, but really you start understanding how their livelihoods are quite diverse and what kind of risks, opportunities, and financial services and advisory services they need to, to grow, right? So these collaborations are creating an ecosystem of value services delivered through shared platforms. And by doing so, this exploits, you know, a lot of economies of scale and scope in an unprecedented manner and improves the viability of delivering financial services to smallholder farmers and agri SMEs in rural areas. So we're starting to see how these models, um, you know, not, are, are challenging I and mean, they don't happen overnight and, and they're not easy to pull off. But when they do, we start to see some benefits. Benefits for farmers who can conveniently and in a less costly manner access a wider diversity of financial services and non-financial services that help them manage their daily lives and improve their resilience and incomes. From the agribusiness side, um, agribusiness benefit a lot from more stable farmer supply and a more loyal farmer partner, right? Because they, the farmers can see the value of um, working with these partners. And that in, in itself uh, helps a lot increase operational efficiencies for the agribusiness. For banks and financial service providers, they can really grow their agricultural and non-agricultural finance portfolio in rural areas 
Um, and by doing so, they're starting to gather a lot more data on rural customer investments and liquidity management needs, which leads them to progressively offer more and more diverse services. And for tech providers, um, they can really leverage on the you know, partner networks like uh, agribusiness network, agent networks, the mobile, mobile uh, uh, phones that uh, many of these rural clients have to use them as a way to deliver more tailored services um, to a very diverse customer segment base, right? So um, uh, these tech providers are really, really good at um, um, finding niches and tailoring services in, 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 in an unprecedented manner. Next slide, please. So as, as an example of, um, you know, this, this type of partnerships, uh, the collaboration with the working group uh, has resulted in a pilot in Kenya that reflects this spirit, right? And in the action paper, we, we also document several more examples of these new types of partnerships and how they work, how they are formed, and some of the uh, potential and also limitations that they still have. But in this particular case, um, we were able to convene a, a very interesting mix of partners. We've got, for example, from the, uh, obviously, the, the smallholder farmers in, in, in rural Kenya, who together with their co-ops come into the mix and are starting to work with um, the MasterCard Farmer Network, which is creating a digital platform um, to pool the data that you need um, and that data relates to uh, production data from farmers and traders, market data that comes mainly from the traders. Um, you've got a lot of information on advisory services that are pulled through, um, you know, uh, the co-ops themselves and facilitators like uh, IDH. Uh, you've got the actual banks like Co-op Bank and Equity Bank who come with the specialized financial uh, services that none of the other partners could provide. And you got facilitators like uh, Farm Fit Fund who come to de-risk um, um, some of the, the, the interventions. And all of that, what that does is that improves the ability to assess and manage the risks of the, the investments the smallholders uh, want to do. Um, and also it lowers the costs of providing such service. Um, so we, we will have time uh, during our panel discussions to go deeper into, into this pilot, but I, I wanted to give you a, a, a little flavor of the type of partnerships that we're talking about. There are approximately 270 million smallholder farmer households in developing countries that require around $240 billion in agricultural and non-agricultural finance annually. Formal financial institutes have, until now, failed to meet their short-term financing needs, leaving a $170 billion gap. They lack the data to understand farmers' risk and the infrastructure to reach them with low-cost products. How can we close the finance gap in smallholder agriculture so that smallholders are able to invest in their farms and families through innovative partnerships? Partnerships that leverage data and technology to reduce the risk. Partnerships with benefits to everyone. Banks can increase their agricultural portfolio by providing farmer-centric services. Agribusiness can increase their efficiency and secure supply through leveraging data and new financial channels. Tech providers can develop new revenue streams by diversifying their products and improving their delivery channels. And smallholder farmers can get access to the agriculture-related information, inputs, and the affordable financing they need to grow. The UNSGSA-initiated Agriculture Finance Working Group is piloting this tech and data-enabled partnership approach with IDH FarmFit in Kenya. Together with our partners, a digital platform is set up that aggregates and anonymizes supply chain data from the field. The results provide new ways of looking at smallholders' credit scores, not only estimating the risks of farm finance, but also suggesting ways to reduce risk 
through the right service packages to farmers. Partners share risks and rewards. In 2021, this pilot kicks off to engage 20,000 smallholders in the coffee and maize sectors in Kenya, dispersing four to six million US dollars in loans. By working in partnerships that leverage our collective strengths, we can close the gap in smallholder finance. Will you join us? Thank you. So, um, to conclude, uh, these experiences that we've uh, documented in this report, um, we show that uh, we can distill key recommendations uh, for private actors or business actors, as well as obviously for the public sector in terms of policies that could help a lot. Now, in, in, this, in this particular webinar, we'll focus on, on those recommendations for um, the private sector. Um, you, if you're interested in the policy side, we will have a, another webinar on July 29th. We will discuss that with, with another set of panelists. But, you know, one of the recommendations, some of the recommendations that come out of, of all of this is that really um, from the private sector end, you, you really require a, a vision towards making this new, you know, types of partnerships work because it, it, it does require quite a bit of knowledge from, um, you know, the leaders of each firm to recognize the opportunities of coming in and merging and, and sharing this type of platforms and data with other types of businesses who traditionally have worked very much separately. I mean, if you consider, uh, you know, the historic trends of the agribusiness sector working, for example, with uh, mobile network operators or working with fintechs or working with payment companies, there hasn't been that, that long uh, a, a, a tradition of working together. So there's a lot of understanding that needs to get place. But what that understanding really entails is really a, a deep understanding of the, the knowledge you have on the customer and how the services from each partner complement each other. Um, so th that's, that's gonna be a key, a key part. And once you recognize that, then you can start uh, um, setting up internal innovation focused teams within your firms that scout these opportunities uh, with other partners and really make it happen. Uh, these opportunities really clearly define the business case for each partner and see how you know the services of an other can help boost the distribution of services of, of your own firm. And you need to, once you recognize, develop these um, physical and digital structures to um, share this data and share the distribution channels um, to deliver your services. So with that, I'll stop and uh, pave way for our uh, panelists. Um, next slide, please. Where we can go a, a bit deeper on, this, on these discussions uh, about recommendations. Um, I'd like to start posing a question um, to Laura from MasterCard. So MasterCard is a, a leading technology company in the merchant payment world. And I was wondering how is it that um, MasterCard has really operationalized this vision that we were talking about, really tackling first the agri-finance space and going through uh, and identifying partners and identifying the different teams within a very large group like MasterCard that are best set up to make these partnerships happen. Could you share with us a little bit of uh, th that experience and how Masco went about it? Yes, absolutely, Amelia. Thank you so much. And thank you to, to Iris and, and IDH and, and to CF and, and uh, uh, your um, SGA for including us not only in the pilot and the program, but here in the panel today. Um, so, you brought up a lot of really important points uh, when you were speaking earlier, and I think it is essential to sort of take that step back, and, and, and you alluded to needing to understand, um, I'm going to go very closely to people's agendas, uh, you know, what are we individually trying to accomplish, why are we in this space, and you know, a lot of folks on the phone might not naturally think of MasterCard as a player in smallholder agricultural farming in places like rural Kenya, Uganda, and Cote d'Ivoire. But MasterCard has been on a journey for the better part of the last 10 years. Um, so back in 2015, 
we made a commitment to the World Bank to bring 500 million uh, underserved or unbanked folks from uh, around the globe into the financial, formal financial sector by providing them access to financial services and products that would actually help them improve their lives and their financial health and stability. Um, I'm, I'm very proud to say that we actually delivered that goal just earlier this year in Q1 of 2020, having reached just over 500 million folks around the globe. And we have extended that commitment out for the next five years uh, with a now commitment to fully reach 1 billion on an underserved folks around the globe by 2025. So as we uh, set about to figure out a, how we would do that, what did that look like? We realized um, that digitizing wages, digitizing supply chains, bringing, leveraging technology um, to create a more inclusive environment around the globe was, was really a role that we, MasterCard, as a payments network um, could, could leverage uh, in the role that we play around the globe with a fully interoperable global network available in 210 countries and territories. So what we determined, we actually did some very, very rigor, rigorous research to identify sectors out around the globe that really had a large opportunity need and opportunity to scale. And one of those was the agricultural sector, uh, where across many, both regions and individual countries, uh, large percentages of the uh, GDP um, and also the impoverished are working in those sectors. So not only is the need great, the opportunity is great. And we realize that that public-private partnership is essential because we need both access into the supply chain, we need to understand the needs, the pain points and the use cases, that vary from country to country and region to region, as well as commodity to commodity. Um, we need to partner with folks who have similar sustainability goals that are trying to not only improve the lives of their workers, improve the productivity of the farm sector that they're working within. Um, and so much of that is either providing and creating an ecosystem foundation linked to interoperable technologies, but also providing things like credit um, and access to digital wages. So we have gone into not only this pilot, but into this sector in two distinct ways. One, MasterCard has created a platform called the MasterCard Farmers Network that is in essence leveraging technology, mobile apps, digitization, to create a marketplace that connects smallholder farmers to producers, to suppliers, to information about crop yields, crop pricing, weather, and allows them to actually um, be a part of a much bigger ecosystem than they might have just in uh, a non-digital and or cash-based environment. Second, uh, we work with a team uh, that works uh, under me called the New Consumers Team to actually work with external partners, and in this case, global commodity brokers and, and leading commodity firms around the globe, to partner with them to reach into the supply chain, we began with the coffee and the cocoa sectors to figure out actually how to take cash out of the system, how to digitize and create direct access to the smallholder farmers on the part of the commodities players such that they can create not only data around those farmers, they can create a relationship with those farmers and via that data and that knowledge, they can in fact enable access to credit directly from the, these major global players that can help these farmers continue to grow and, and uh, expand not only their, their, their small holdings, uh, their businesses. Um, to use the coffee sector as an example, one of the things I think we all know is coffee supply around the globe has just absolutely grown exponentially over the last number of years. And you know the, 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 the um, uh, relevance of 
places like Starbucks growing around the globe are, are evidence of that. But the smallholder farmer um, sector is in fact not growing to keep pace with. And they have to grapple with things like climate change, which absolutely impact the health and the yields of, of their um, farm holdings. Um, we have all been very, very directly impacted over the course of the past five months with the impact of a global pandemic. And one of the things that we've absolutely realized is that something as supposedly simple as creating digital access to their funds and the payment in a year of social distance requirements has become in fact essential. And um, so we've seen that many, many of our partners who have been driven and seen the value and seen the benefit of digitizing uh, supply chain, digitizing wages, creating um, interconnected platforms, now see it as actually urgent given the crisis that has come down upon us. So, you know, we feel in a very fortunate position with this program because uh, this is something that the players here on this call today and the entire ecosystem surrounding it have been focused on, you know, as I've said, for two, if not five years, if not longer. Um, but the unique circumstance of this year have fundamentally reinforced uh, the critical nature of the work that we're all doing. And, and you said it, Emilio, earlier, one company on their own is not able to drive change. We need to come together to do this. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, and thanks for sharing uh, uh, what uh, uh, a structured approach you, you are using, uh, right? To, to look at new opportunities, and I think it's uh, uh, very helpful that you stress the importance of digitization and even more, right? Uh, uh, during times of this pandemic, uh, I'm, I'm keen to move on to to Purva, and Purva, uh, your company is in a in a different business than, than, than Laura's is. Um, so you are sourcing largely from smallholder farmers and you have worked on financial inclusion models already for the past decade with ETG and the ETG Farmers Foundation. Um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on the partnership that we're working on in Kenya? Is this different from some of the other setups that you're working on? And um, we, we prepared a, 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 a visual to, to support you in, in, in um, getting our participants through understanding how the, how the setups uh, work and what, what is different. Over to you, Purva. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. And thank you, Emilio and uh, working group partners for including me. It has been a pleasure working the last few years together. And uh, we really are looking forward to have a successful pilot. So to jump right into the question you asked here is that, uh, and what Laura and Emilio have been saying, that this is not the work of one entity alone. And I would say that some of us have been pioneers in export trading group, a 53-year-old company with roots in Africa. We started this work in 2010 building financial inclusion models starting from Uganda and since then we have worked in six countries across southern and eastern Africa. So the slide here on one side which, uh, which describes the pilot, the Kenyan uh, Equin pilot model and on the left hand side uh, it describes kind of I have synthesized about eight different models and in eight different commodities that we have implemented and designed. So as you can see, uh, ETG, Export Trading Group, with, the, uh, with collaboration with the Export Trading uh, Foundation, we actually did everything, group selection, uh, coming up with a relationship with the bank, selection of the commodity and uh, extension, as well as the, what kind of financial model will work with the bank. But prior to that, we started building the farmer groups with our own funding 
and sometimes with slight uh, help from the donors and up to three years we build the farmer groups and their credit history so that they could be not all but a great deal of them can be included uh, uh, for a financial inclusion by the bank and as you can see in the slide farmers foundation along with etg we acted uh, as a single entity in extension selection procurement the last mile and uh, finally even doing the repayment to the bank so in this particular instance the bank's job was to give uh, approve the loan uh, input finance while rest of the work became the responsibility and huge financial risk on part of the trader and it, through an organization like foundation also developmental fund other thing i would like to add is etg always offered the floor price floor price gives confidence to the farmers it builds trust that the buyer is committed and it also allows practitioners like us to teach cost analysis cost benefit to the farmers and say no matter what you will get this price and should the market go up you will get market price now having these experiences the current model in uh, uh, under ecfin pilot is you can see that the etg farmers foundation experiences are now looking at eaff which is farmer uh, east african farmers federation which is a cooperative it has it's in a cooperative umbrella and we have been uh, as etg we've been working with them uh, for quite some years and uh, using different models under the current model what we have seen i will highlight the couple of benefits so that etg export trading group is going to buy commodities from the, the number of farmers which would be maize it can be soybean it can be sorghum multiple other co food commodities uh, the bank is going to provide the input finance and that is going to be channeled through the cooperative body the cooperative body is the main uh, entity that is going to provide the extension using the partly the staff of etg or their own and mainly digital platform to do knowledge transfer the create the establish the farmers data who are going to get the input finance and when it comes to aggregation and loan repayment it is again going to be channeled through this cooperative body this way you can see that the role of etg becomes uh, input supplier wherever the inputs are uh, uh, they have the right inputs to support the program and they are commodity buyer and the risk is hugely reduced yes the the floor price still exists etg is still offering the floor price which also is a substantial risk for a trader especially when the policy environment can change any time in certain parts of africa and these commodities so but that is the major risk and however the operational cost will be dramatically reduced uh, and uh, farmers are going to get the, the benefits of lower interest rate because the bank uh, with the uh, buyback agreement and the multi-stakeholder multi partnership and transparency of the data collection and the progress that they can see which farmer has done what it is we are hopeful that the interest rate is almost going to be reduced by 10 percent so this is a huge huge benefit to the farmers so this is the kind of platform that is that we have contributed our own experiences and we are really really hopeful that um, if uh, through digital technology and of course we can still build the same level of trust because for the farmers unless and until they experience uh, the benefits and uh, all the 
the trust with the trader, the trust with the bank, trust with the service provider, that is when we actually win the model. But we are hopeful that this uh, partnership with multi-stakeholder platform will uh, give benefits to all the parties involved. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. That's, that's very helpful. And I think it's also good to highlight that in this uh, model in Kenya, uh, that uh, since the bank gets access to, to more data, uh, together with Rabobank, uh, we're also working on on looking uh, on a credit risk scoring model and see how that data can take be taken into account to better score the credit risk. And this also should lead, uh, as a proof indicated, right, to more affordable um, loans for farmers. Uh, Emilio, over to you. Yeah. Thank you. We move over to uh, ask a question to Daniele. Um, Daniele, so uh, GSMA is is the association of, of global no mobile network operators and MNOs have traditionally not been considered uh, a, a big player in the rural finance or rural payment space. But over the past maybe uh, uh, six to 10 years, you, you've increasingly uh, been, become a very active partner in, in these rural financial markets. I was wondering, um, what is it, how is it that the GSMA as an association has been um, uh, identifying the business case for their constituents to enter the agricultural finance space? How are these new partnerships uh, that MNOs are building to enter these new markets uh, working? And how do these partnerships help diversify the service offer that uh, you, you provide to rural dwellers over time. Maybe you can tell us a little, a little bit about that journey. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Emilio, for the question. And it's uh, uh, great to be here uh, today in this, in this webinar. I think to, to answer uh, a question about the business case and uh, opportunities for partnerships, uh, it, it's important to start from the, from the technology, from the assets that, uh, uh, and services that uh, mobile network operators and mobile money providers, and sometimes uh, they, are, they are the same, MNOs that are also uh, mobile, mobile money providers, um, have uh, in-house and what, what they can offer uh, to the agricultural sector. Uh, of course, we're talking at the most basic levels. We're looking at connectivity. Uh, we know that connectivity is increased uh, hugely in uh, uh, low to middle income countries, including in, uh, in uh, rural areas. Uh, however, we also know that rural populations are, um, according to our statistics, uh, they are about 40% less likely to use the mobile, the mobile internet. So we know the mobile phones is the key tool to deliver uh, many of these uh, services to uh, uh, smallholder farmers, including financial services through mobile money, for example. But we need to be very mindful about the access uh, channels. So developing an app is not always the, the viable solution. Um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, 2G channels, very basic uh, technology channels that also mobile network operators have are still very, very important. And I'm thinking of uh, SMS, text-based uh, services like USSD, SMS, which are of course very, very used in, uh, in, in many places, uh, including for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in, and in South Asia. Uh, then of course, uh, besides the technology uh, assets, uh, we have the marketing and sales uh, capabilities of MNOs, of course, the customer relationships, the agents on the ground, uh, the brand recognition that is that is that is very important. And over the, over the past few years, as you as you said, Emilio, we've been working with MNOs uh, to use uh, exactly these this, uh, these assets uh, to uh, offer a value proposition to enable uh, MNOs and others that work with MNOs in partnerships to provide a value uh, proposition to the agricultural sector. Um, what have we done over the past few years? Uh, we have been working on communication services, of course, many times when we're talking about digitizing uh, agricultural value chains or digital agricultural solutions. Uh, we're thinking about information, digital advisories uh, provided to, to, to farmers. Uh, and this is on top of the core services that uh, mobile network operators have, of course, the voice and, uh, and, and the SMS and the internet services that they, that they can offer. Uh, in the report of, of the UNSGSA uh, that, 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 that we are launching and, pre and presenting today, uh, we mentioned the work that we've done, for example, on digital advisories uh, as GSMA in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, 
uh, with operators like Tenenor and Dialog uh, that have actually uh, been able to scale uh, digital advisories for farmers. But then, of course, talking about financial inclusion, we felt that uh, uh, it's fundamental to you. To, we feel that it's fundamental to leverage mobile money as a key delivery uh, channel. We're talking about 290 live uh, mobile money services in 95 countries uh, globally and 370 million active accounts. And of course, information and digital advisory is, is critical, but uh, enabling access to finance and using the mobile phone and mobile money as a channel uh, to reach uh, farmers is fundamental. So uh, when we're thinking about the business case, really um, the work that we're doing at the moment is around uh, enabling the digitization of agricultural value chain. And uh, the business case for, for MNOs is really to expand the, uh, the, the, their reach to, to rural areas. And to do that, uh, you can only do so by uh, offering relevant services. Uh, if you want to expand as an MNO your average revenue per customer, you need to, to be very relevant with your value proposition and address specific pain points that farmers experience. And these pain points are uh, very clear in, uh, in agricultural value chains. Um, this is why we think it, it's fundamental to work with the value chains, to work with value chain actors, agribusinesses, uh, and cooperatives to actually leverage MNO capabilities to provide services that address the needs uh, of smallholder farmers and of value chain actors. In other words, if we are able to uh, develop digital tools uh, that can address pain points and deliver efficiencies for agribusinesses and cooperatives, and in turn can also provide value to smallholder farmers, for example, the ability to receive their payments on, on a mobile money wallet and therefore stimulating uh, usage of mobile money, the ability to save cash on their mobile money wallets. This is really beneficial to all different actors in, in the value chain. So initially a lot of work that we've done uh, has been around uh, digitizing payments uh, and we've been working for, for a while with uh, mobile network operators and mobile money providers to digitize in business to person payments. Uh, in agricultural value chains. The key fundamental entry, entry point potentially for, for, for financial inclusion for, for, for farmers. Um, in terms of the business case for MNOs, just the opportunity in terms of revenue opportunity, uh, the revenue that could be generated by, by MNOs just in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, through the transaction fees uh, of, of mobile money payments, of uh, digitizing mobile money payments is about 290, just, just short of 300 million. Uh, uh, US dollars in, uh, in 2025. So it's quite a, a significant opportunity just in terms of uh, increasing, increasing your revenue uh, from mobile money and, and of course from mobile money services and of course it's an opportunity to start providing very relevant uh, services for, the, uh, for, the, for farmers and for the agricultural uh, sector. Um, but it's not only about digitizing payments in, in agricultural value chains. Um, it, it is really uh, an opportunity to uh, work with agribusinesses. And fundamentally, it's an opportunity, we think, for, for MNOs to develop enterprise solutions, business to business, but I would say business to business to consumer or business to business to farmer uh, type of services that, as I said before, address the pain points that uh, the farmers and uh, agribusiness and cooper cooperative, uh, cooperatives have. Transactional data that can be generated through from payments, from digitizing these payments is absolutely critical. Uh, like Purva said, and as has been said before, in terms of developing the economic identity for, for financial inclusion and of course for credit scoring. But it's not the only data point that is, uh, that is, that is critical in, in, in the creation of this economic identity. Um, there are other data points that can be generated from uh, digitizing value chains and through digital tools uh, that can be deployed in, in, in value chains. For example, farmer records, farm records, uh, procurement records about the qu quantity and quality of crops that can all be digitized through a, uh, through a mobile, mobile based uh, service or, 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 a digital, or a digital tool that is used by, by the agribusiness uh, in, uh, to, to streamline operations uh, uh, with farmers. Um, so for us, really, in order to, 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 to enable this kind of, uh, kind of solutions, it's about forming partnerships between MNOs, MMPs, mobile money providers. Of course, the agribusinesses and the cooperatives will be the users together with the farmers of these solutions. But 
we also need to work with agritex company that has specialized in in the, in the sector i work within gsma in a program that is actually the agritech program so we do have the expertise internally as an association but we recognize that mnos um, are not necessarily experts in, uh, in 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 the agricultural sector so they need to partner with with others and of course the the, the, the partnership ultimately also needs uh, a financial service provider to be able to use this digital data these digital records that can be generated through a value chain digitization initiatives. Uh, the final thing that I will say uh, just very briefly is, uh, yes, absolutely, mobile money for us is, is a key uh, asset uh, uh, that can enable uh, the digitization of transaction and payments. Uh, but uh, um, there are also there is also an opportunity to work in markets where mobile money is, is, is not there. We know there are many markets where there isn't uh, an enabling uh, mobile money environment. Uh, so um, we have just recently uh, worked, we're actually working directly in seven markets currently. Not all of them are uh, mobile money markets. Two of them, namely Nigeria and Indonesia, are non enabling for mobile money. And in these markets, actually, we can work with Agritex in partnership with MNOs and with, ba with banks and, of course, with agribusinesses and farmers. Uh, in order to develop digital tools that exactly, as I said before, can digitize key data points within value, within value chains. Uh, let's imagine, for example, the digitization of procurement records, land mapping, for example, the ability to map very clearly uh, a farm. Uh, all data that is critical to financial service providers eventually to perform credit scoring for farmers and enabling uh, access to, uh, to, to, to financial services for farmers. And of course, uh, through, through all this work, we, we are providing very relevant services for uh, for the agricultural sector. Daniela, thanks for, for adding that, uh, that last piece. Um, we are, we're keen to, to make sure that uh, the participants actually have, uh, we, we have seen quite a number of questions popping up in the Q&A, and I think it would be great to uh, ask those questions directly to our panelists. So uh, what we would like to do is, um, we would like to, uh, for each of the panel, uh, sorry, for each of the participants, um, to think about um, whom you have most questions for. So we ha have set up three breakout rooms. Um, so what you need to do is you need to copy the link and it's also now in the chat. Uh, you need to close this Zoom call and um, enter the new one with this link so please make sure that you are copying it before you lock off because otherwise i think we run the risk of uh, losing you um, so if you feel you would like to have better insight on the work of mastercard and how they're dealing with those partnerships please join the link uh, with laura in a minute for purva if you're keen to better understand how etg and etg foundation has organized um, access to finance and how this new pilot is working uh, please connect to the breakout room where Purfa um, will, be, uh, will be present. And if you want to learn more about the partnerships and services of mobile money uh, um, companies and mobile network operators, um, please uh, join the, um, the breakout room of Daniele. And as said, you also find the uh, links in the chat. So, uh, copy it and um, we will um, we will close this one and our panelists will be ready for you in those uh, um, in those uh, new zoom links and then uh, after the the discussions with the panelists we won't come back to this uh, session so uh, I would like to uh, thank you already on behalf of uh, Emilia and Peter um, we're looking forward to more interaction and uh, more questions, but we will do this in this breakout because we think this will allow uh, uh, more uh, more interaction. Okay, thank you very much, and we will send all um, uh, documents and, and the video uh, afterwards. So let me see. We have about nine participants. I see. Um, Maybe we can start the discussion um, already. I, I expect others will, will continue to connect. Um, but um, I'm, I'm happy to first uh, 
allow those who have uh, connected to pose a question to Daniele. Um, I have several questions of my own, but certainly I'll, I'll, I'll give you priority. Um, would, does anybody have uh, or volunteers to ask the first question? Happy to accommodate. I think you can unmute yourselves uh, if if you um, if you want to pose a question. Emilio, Peter here. Maybe I'll start uh, off the discussion uh, with a question I had. Sure, please go ahead. Great. So, Daniele, thanks so much for your intervention. Very interesting. Um, you talked a bit about the business case um, and also the need for MNOs to partner uh, with other institutions. Um, so, we generally think of MNOs as um, you know, relatively young, fast-growing companies um, which have a specialization uh, in payments, um, digital payments, um, and, and, and probably spend a lot of their time focused on expanding um, outreach um, and, and sort of reacting vis-a-vis -vis some of the more incumbent players. Um, so my question is, um, what, you know, what specific skills do MNOs need in order to, to really move in to sort of the, the ag finance um, partnership uh, market um, to do so sustainably and, and, and where do you see this kind of taking hold um, and, and what are some of the elements, um, the recipes for success um, to sort of help MNOs move out of their core specialization? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Peter, for, for the question. Um, in terms of the um, well, I, I can tell you the, the learnings that we that we have had uh, working with uh, MNOs uh, for a few years on, on digital agriculture solutions. Now, uh, focusing more on uh, enabling uh, financial financial inclusion and providing uh, financial services. But I think the the learnings are are very applicable to the to, to our experience really across different uh, you know working on different uh, use cases, digital use cases. Um, yes, it's true. MNOs operate in very competitive environments. They are uh, huge organizations and uh, very often under um, uh, significant pressure. And I would say as a general comment, what we have learned is that to focus on the agricultural sector and on rural, which is a key uh, growth opportunity uh, for, for MNOs, is fundamentally, it's fundamental to be, to be able to focus on the sector and to have a certain uh, element of agility in, uh, in MNOs operations. So, when we support them, uh, as GSMA, we do provide support in the form of, form of grant funding, technical consultancy. One of the very first things that we, we ask them is to have dedicated key performance indicators for their uh, agricultural projects. So to enable them the flexibility to have a certain co commercial patience, I think that's really a, a, critical, a critical point to allow the projects the necessary time to uh, develop uh, and, uh, and, and scale. It is not, we know very well from, from, from experience that is um, launching a, a digital advisory or uh, launching an initiative to digitize agricultural value chains and enabling digital financial services for farmers is going to take some time, is going to take uh, commercial patience. Um, so that is fundamental. We've seen for example, they also work here at, uh, with the sea level within MNOs is, is, is critical to success, having that kind of sea level endorse, endorsement and direct. Uh, one of the things that we ask is actually with the, with the MNOs that we work with is to have that type of visibility and support within, within the organization. With this kind of approach, dedicated KPIs, sea level and endorsement, commercial patients, we have seen MNOs that have been able actually to develop to, to the first in answer to the first part of your question, we've seen MNOs that have been able to develop a certain degree of expertise, in some case quite a high degree of expertise in designing services for the rural sector. I mentioned briefly in my answer before in, in the webinar a couple of examples. One is uh, the MNO dialogue in Pakistan and another one is the MNO Telenor, uh, sorry, dialogue in Sri Lanka and the other one is the MNO dial um, Telenor in Pakistan. Uh, they have actually uh, their own um, agricultural uh, unit uh, so it's a specialized unit within within the MNOs. It doesn't it doesn't happen very often. So we're very excited, and we we kind we we are looking to really replicate and export that type of model. What it means is essentially there are specialists within the MNO that work on the agricultural segment and uh, understand uh, the, the the specific needs of agricultural customers. Focus on that segment. Uh, even we've been doing with them, for example, uh, user centric uh, research. 
HCD uh, research, uh, research to, to product development. So we actually have our product managers at the MNOs who go out with partners, of course, uh, agri-techs, content companies, different type of organizations that collaborate for the, to, to create and develop these services, who actually go in the ground and in rural areas to uh, uh, develop uh, the, the services. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Manuel Camacho, uh, where he says he would like your thoughts, Daniele, on what you're seeing in Latin America in terms of uh, advancing mobile money there. Um, could, you, could you comment on that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, yeah, I made a comment before as well in, in the webinar about more or less enabling uh, regulatory environments for, uh, for uh, mobile money. Uh, Latin, Latin America is, is, is a region where, we, where mobile money has been, has been around for, for some time. The, there are markets in, in Central America where it's uh, more uh, advanced or more available than, than other markets. Uh, notably, large markets like uh, Brazil, for example, have, have really struggled, struggled in terms of seeing the, the, the uptake of, of, of mobile money. Um, we are currently uh, doing work in Latin America. We are actually, it, it's a good question, it's very timely because we are actually, it, it hasn't been a primary focus for us. Typically as GSMA uh, in agri, the Agritech program, we mostly focus on Sub-Saharan Africa and, so, and South Asia. Now we have, we have spent quite a bit of time, I say now, but in the past few years to, to actually do work in digital agriculture in, in Latin America. It's true that mobile money is more challenging uh, as I said, it's not as enabling as, as different markets. However, uh, it's challenging when it comes to the uh, end, last, to the last mile. No? So you don't have the same uh, environment whereby you have mobile money agents uh, that are very uh, present and available in, in rural areas. So you don't have really the opportunity to do cash in, cash out, the model that we see in East Africa, for example, or in Ghana, where mobile money is, is, is very much available, including in rural areas. Um, where we're seeing um, very interesting models in, so if we take out the, the, the last mile, which is a pain point in Latin America, and there are ways to, to go around it, perhaps you need to partner with other organizations, uh, using banks, ATMs, using different ways of distributing cash in rural areas. But certainly there is um, a significant, what we've seen that there is quite a, um, 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 a lot of uh, innovation in Latin America in credit scoring. Uh, there are some interesting companies that are actually looking at using alternative digital data points uh, to enable uh, credit scoring and to develop those economic identities for farmers. Uh, there is one organization, for example, called Incluir Tech in Colombia. They, we, we know them very well. They're, they're very interesting, actually. They, they work in agricultural value chains to uh, access uh, anonymized data from farmers. So very similar to the model of the partnership that we've been uh, talking about today. And uh, uh, they form partnerships with insurance companies, with banks to actually uh, provide this, this data uh, to, to this organization to enable uh, alternative credit scoring and provide financial services to farmers. So yeah, if we take out that pain point that is the last mile, I think there is a lot of innovation that is happening higher up and uh, we're seeing credit scoring uh, in Latin America because th the need is there, of course. Farmers need financial services and they might have access to a bank account in, in Colombia but, or, or in other places in, in Latin America, but that doesn't mean they are, they are financially included. Uh, and uh, therefore, using digital data for more intelligent credit scoring is, is certainly an opportunity, and we've seen quite a few examples in different markets there. Daniele, we have a question from Samuel Muturi, and I'll, and I'll be opportunistic here, uh, Samuel, and, and, and build on your question. Uh, his question really goes to um, the point on how, what, what does it take for MNOs to create real super platforms that aggregate a lot of services um, and uh, uh, that, that, is that are accessible to farmers? And I think this question is, is, is relevant um, to the CGAP's own experience in terms of um, um, seeing the formation of uh, digital ecosystems where, for example, you've got, let's say, the, 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 the key case of an MNO, which you describe in your panel uh, presentation, Daniele, you create a platform that very much first moves into the B2C kind of space, creating bulk payments for smallholders and agricultural value chains, right? 
one of the challenges that we've seen in, in scaling them further than what they have achieved so far relates to the use case that smallholders have for electronic money, meaning that smallholders, once they get paid electronically, they need to cash out and then they need to reach out to an agent that in the case of rural areas, sometimes is far away or suffers from liquidity management and cannot honor that cash out request. So that becomes problematic. So that creates the link to the concept of super platform or a digital ecosystem where if you have complementary services that create use cases for that e-money, you reduce that need to cash out and you make it in theory more convenient for the farmer or any rural dweller actually to accept e-money as a payment, right? Um, what has been your experience in terms of facilitating that uh, creation of ancillary services that help scale your B2C portfolio? Talking about merchant payments, for example. Um, how, um, what does it take to, to, to make those scale in rural areas? Yeah. Yeah, um, when, when you're talking about uh, uh, super platforms, um, my, my thought immediately, my, my, my brain went to, <laughs> I was starting thinking about uh, uh, the example, for example, oh, the example of DigiFarm in, in, in Kenya with Safaricom, no? So that kind of um, uh, holistic uh, platform that allows really, it's a one-stop shop fundamentally for, for smallholder farmers no? and, and, and for agribusinesses. Um, another example that comes to mind is, is Zimbabwe to an extent where they have a very strong bundled proposition for the digital agricultural sector. I'm, I'm thinking about EcoFarmer uh, by, by Econet. Um, these are, I think, very promising, uh, very promising solutions that we, we have seen. Pretty unique at the moment. Uh, we, we've seen them in a, in a couple of markets. And of course, of course Kenya benefits from... Uh, the huge penetration and the huge success story that M-Pesa is. So it is a very different story uh, and it's kind of difficult to compare Kenya with uh, with other markets. Um, Digifarm po probably would only be possible uh, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a place like, like Kenya as, as such a, an ambitious and uh, a type, of, type of service that is able really to provide these this services all, all, all in one platform. Um, it is, um, I think it's, uh, it's a question of, I, there, I don't think there is a um, one answer to that question. It very much depends on, on, on market dynamics um, in terms of the opportunity to provide these end-to-end -end, uh, end -end solutions. Uh, certainly, the point that you make is, is, is very true in terms of adoption of mobile money. It, it, is, it is a gradual adoption. We are seeing that as a gradual adoption. So what we've seen um, in our experience is that uh, mobile money does need uh, cash in and cash out initially because it's, it's the fundamental business of, of mobile money. You need uh, incentives for agents and uh, obviously agents have commissions and uh, it's the first pain point that you're actually addressing uh, to farmers, the, the, the opportunity to cash in and cash out. Uh, um, uh, money, but of course, uh, if, if, if that is all that you can offer is very challenging, challenging, as you say, to, to, to scale. Secondary use cases typically that we've seen is the peer-to-peer -peer transactions and uh, mobile money top-ups. Uh, of course, uh, over time, I think from what we've seen in our, in our experience is if we just stick to the, the opportunity to, to drive expansion uh, of mobile money services and adoption, we see a strong opportunity in enabling business to uh, person to business payments. We've seen, for example, a great demand in uh, in places uh, in East Africa to enable school payments, uh, health payments. Uh, so I, I think, in answer to your question, it's probably around having a very detailed understanding of the pain points that you experience in different markets. What, what are the most likely use cases that you need to add on a digital wallet to stimulate that adoption? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a gradual process. And merchant payments, you make a very good point, is, uh, is a very good promising, obviously very relevant use case. It's, it's challenging when it needs a device, a point of sale, a sale device, but we know that the, 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 the demand is there. The, the, the challenge is how you can design it uh, efficiently. Um, then, of course, going back to the point about super platforms, I think we call it bundling maybe. That is a good way or a good step towards that kind of model. What we know is that uh, certainly standalone services that address very specific needs are more difficult to provide to a, to, to a success, successfully, effectively to a small order farmer. You can have a very well executed service, for example, an insurance service. We know well that insurance is, is absolutely critical for farmers, 
but farmers might struggle to understand what uh, the value of insurance is for them. But if you bundle it with advisory, if you bundle it with payments, then you're starting to develop that, uh, that uh, more extensive value proposition that uh, has much more of a chance to develop and, 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 and scale. Maybe not quite a super platform, um, but uh, it's certainly a step in, 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 in the right direction. Thanks. Another critical, um, um, let's say, roadblock to further scale relates to farmer onboarding and the type of um, KYC requirements that um, are needed and how convenient they are for smallholders. So a question from, from uh, um, uh, Samuel Darko is, um, what are your experience in terms of simplified digital services um, that both enable the offering service but also prevent uh, fraud or abuse and, and, and you have that due diligence, um, enough due diligence to prevent those. What are some of the good practices that you've seen can, can help in that direction? Yeah, I think uh, with, uh, with KYC, um, in our experience so far, and we are launching, we are, when I say we are launching, we are working with mobile operators at the moment. We, we're providing them technical consultancy uh, under our, our innovation fund to, to, to develop these kind of services. When it comes to KYC, is is again is a very dif different environment in, in 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 different countries with different with different requirements. My general observation here is that working with with value chains, so the kind of approach that we have at the moment, that is very consistent with the approach that uh, uh, UNSGSA is, is advocating and uh, what we're presenting with the report and uh, and the pilot in in Kenya is that uh, working with value chains, with value chain actors, with agribusinesses, with cooperatives who have established relationships with farmers can be very, uh, can be very helpful as well in order to onboard effectively farmers. You already have field agents uh, on the ground that have established relationships with smallholder farmers and can help in collecting that critical KYC data that is, that is, that is needed. There are models whereby you can, you can have a mobile money agent that is also a field agent or a local um, member of the, of, of the community. Uh, we've also seen examples of um, um, really community coming together to provide missing, um, missing elements, m missing documentation, for example, uh, in, in KYC. But really try, try, to, uh, try to work, uh, working with, with value chain actors is, is, uh, is a, it can be really a, uh, a great opportunity. It's, uh, it allows to have those feet on the ground to address some of these, of these challenges. But it's a very, it's a very different, uh, scenario and we've seen some countries that are having a more progressive uh, environment now whereby they are lowering uh, or reducing the KYC requirements uh, enabling as well the, the, the underserved users to, 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 to join uh, to, to be able to subscribe uh, to, to services whereas in other in other places it's, it's still it can still be a, a pain point thanks uh, we're we basically uh, would have time for just one more question, uh, maybe two two more minutes, and um, um, I'll I'll ask this question coming from uh, Andita. Um, what is what are some of the strategies you see MNOs could take in markets that are very heavily bank dominated, uh, like Indonesia, for example, which you you had mentioned. Uh, what do you see your your MNO members uh, exploring when it comes to opportunities in in the rural finance space there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, as I mentioned as well before, we are actually doing work in Indonesia and Nigeria. There are less enabling uh, environments for for fintech and for for mobile money uh, providers, but still the opportunity is there. I think. The key opportunity here is to develop uh, digital solutions uh, for agricultural value chains. So what we're seeing is that besides mobile money, and obviously with mobile money, you can get your uh, transactional data. That is absolutely critical. You know, it's a very useful uh, data point that you can, you can add to, to your econom to, to economic identities for farmers. But if you're not able to digitize those payments, and of course you have that pain point in the last mile to, 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 to use a service like mobile money in, in a market like Indonesia, um, there is an opportunity to generate data, a variety of data through digital tools that address the, the needs of, of agribusinesses. So in, Indonesia is actually quite innovative in terms of uh, 
uh, technology and uh, we, we've seen so many tech startups that have solutions that digitize procurement uh, um, by digitizing farmer and farm records. We've seen data hubs that enable insurance uh, companies and uh, banks to actually access data, anonymize data uh, that is provided uh, directly from farmers through, through, through a platform. There are many IoT companies that have very relevant uh, sensor data that is generated data-driven type of solutions that provide better advisory for farmers by enabling localized monitoring of operations. But this data is also very useful because it's data that is about the farm, about the quality of the soil. You can do land mapping, as I mentioned before. All data points that can be used in in complementarity, of course, with other data data sources uh, to uh, to do credit credit scoring uh, and um, and and to do to assess the uh, credit worthiness of, of farmers. So perhaps similar to, to to the point that I was making before on on, on Latin America, in places like Indonesia as well, we're seeing some interesting innovation when it comes to. Uh, credit scoring, in, in fact, using this digital value chain data and really uh, using it in partnership with, with, with banks. Banks still need alternative data sets. Uh, that's, that's the reality too. And the risk of lending to the agricultural sector is, is very high. The question is, how can we use digital tools to complement uh, the data that is, uh, that is out there and to facilitate um, the provision of financial services? Right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Daniele, for uh, answering all our questions. And, and thank you to all participants for joining the session. I, I hope you'd enjoy the webinar. We, we've come to a conclusion. Uh, please uh, feel free to look for the recording and, and, and disseminating your networks. So thank you so much. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Clay. I am the host. Uh, if you have questions, please post your questions in the chat. Uh, either then, I mean, like if uh, there is uh, not many people asking at the same time, uh, I will call out your names. Uh, if not, I will uh, ask uh, the question for you guys. Sounds good? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I mean, like, I know Peter already asked uh, a question uh, in the chat. Peter, do you want to go what ahead and ask the question to Laura? What? What is that? A little noise, Laura. What do you want? I'm having a hard time hearing, so perhaps if people that aren't actually speaking could go on mute and maybe um, it will come through clear. Uh, yes, I muted the, the people that are not speaking, uh, yet at the same time uh, also I mean, like I will unmute if uh, people want to uh, ask a question. Uh, and so Peter, please, uh, please go ahead. Okay, my question was, I see a lot of uh, thinking around how to finance relatively small amounts of money, often for staple crops, where if you look into tree crops, we need a significant amount of money per hectare. We need a loan with tenure of six years with three year grace period. Is that at one point in time going to be an opportunity or is that still too far away? Uh, so, Peter, and, and I'm also going to introduce, I see that one of my colleagues, Mo Rizwanil, is on the phone as well, who has been very, very much leading MasterCard's initiatives on the ground uh, with our uh, smallholder farmer community. But what I, I would say is we collectively, as an industry and an, an ecosystem, are evaluating all types and sizes of credit needs. Um, so, you know, I absolutely would put it on the map as not only a use case, but, but an opportunity. Um, it may not be one of the, the more immediate. One of the things that we MasterCard specialize in, and, you know, if you, if you think of back to uh, the original uh, sort of platform diagram that, that Emilio showed, and then the diagram that ETG is using, MasterCard in the role that we play are not inherently credit providers. 
So we work with an entire ecosystem of partners whose role it is, in fact, to provide that credit out. And whether that be uh, local um, financial issuing institutions or local banks that might provide, you know, either smaller or larger uh, credit loans out to, to the market, whether they be the global commodities players that are looking to help drive the sustainability of their, their smallholder farmers, whether it be, you know, the likes of a rural bank in a, in a global payment. So there are many, many different players in the ecosystem that are coming together and will individually sort of parse out um, the not only type and size of financing and credit that they are looking to not only make available but facilitate and enable. And, and I know, you know, Danielle's comment specifically from the perspective of the mobile network operators, you know, is it, on the ecosystem enablement is something that we at MasterCard focus very, very strongly on. So for, for our perspective, ensuring that that overall acceptance ecosystem is in place when we digitize pay and make credit available or financing available to fi farmers. Can they use those funds in that format within their communities um, is something that we take into, into account. And, and Mo, it looks like you've got you know, a comment. Jay, if we can unmute Mo for a second so that he can also comment into the question. Uh, hi, Laura. Thanks. Um, I was just I was just saying that uh, to answer the question, like uh, just to add on to what you were saying, uh, the provision of an account for the farmer and giving them an economic identity, especially with the groups of farmers that we're working with, is is the first step. I'm hearing some other noise. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Peter, does that help? Yeah, no, it makes sense. And it, it's good for all, it's good to understand what the roles of various organizations are. There are credit providers, there are financiers, and there are the enablers in the system. And it's good to realize that MasterCard is the enabler in the system. And well, maybe we just need to make sure that when we start talking about the needs for tree crops farmers, that that also is going to be captured in systems. Uh, you know, and it may take different uh, data collection. It may, may it may take different ways of monitoring progress rather than monitoring yields. But that's that's those are technical things that we can solve. But uh, it's good to hear that from a Mastercard perspective, at least those opportunities are uh, definitely not excluded. Thanks. No, not at all. And, and I just will we'll finish up with one last comment on something you just said. Um, the, the approach that MasterCard takes when we go into market um, is always, first and foremost, to go actually into the country, into the region, uh, into the sector, and um, identify what, in fact, are the needs of the, each individual and particular community. You know, what, what are their credit needs? What are the pain points that they're dealing with in growing and, you know, keeping their business float and sustainable? And it is based on that identification of pain points that we then create, you know, largely a bespoke solution specific to the needs of those sectors, countries, regions, commodities, what have you. Uh, Laura, uh, Andrew has a question for you, and uh, he is asking how would MasterCard support agribusinesses, startups dealing with uh, smallholder farmers? So, you know, following up on the comment that I just made, and, and that I'm going to start, I'm going to point again to Mo because we start by having named, a, you know, an entire team. Um, whose sole focus is looking at the agricultural sector. So we begin by identifying, um, you know, the region, the, the market, the commodity, the individual countries. We then work to build out a team uh, which starts with our local in-market MasterCard team um, for everything that we do. And, and I think the structure of the farm fit fund and, and pilot program, you know, emulates and is similar to. Um, once we've identified the needs of the market, we then start to immediately identify who are the partners that we need to go to market with. And because we are MasterCard, 
and we don't provide credit, we will always need a local financial institution um, where the solutions are, you know, often largely a prepaid solution. We'll need a processor, a program manager to partner with those issuers. Um, we generally need uh, somebody like a payment facilitator in the local market. We, we obviously need the access into the supply chain. So whether that is, you know, the commodities broker or uh, the government themselves, the financial inclusion minister, in many cases, you know, Ghana is a great example of where we work directly with the minister to try and connect to the sustainability goals that they're trying to drive across, um, across their country. Um, often, and a critical element, I spoke a minute ago to the, the criticality of the acceptance ecosystem in place within the landscape, but another critical element throughout these absolutely and fundamentally is the education, training, and financial literacy of the market. So as we design and develop, you know, identify the needs of the market, we also do a full on assessment of the level of understanding and financial literacy that any particular smallholder farmer community has. And based on sort of where we set the bar with that, we generally work with a series of NGO partners that we have, Fundacion Capital in, in, in Latin America, BSR, the Business for Social Responsibility across Asia and, and Middle East and Africa, um, to design training programs and really get on the ground to touch these people individually and help them understand as an example, if they've been given access to credit, if they've been given digital payment, you know, or uh, a mobile application to manage their, 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 their farming, their business, and, and their finances, do they know how to use it? Do they know that they can transact through these same tools? Do they know that they can, in fact, extract cash from an ATM you know, and leverage cash when they need cash? So, so all of those are part and parcel of how we develop programs and go to market. Uh, thanks, Laura. Lloyd uh, from uh, Tony Blair Institute is uh, asking about how are you, like a farmer is part of a supply chain, right? Or an ecosystem. How are you supporting the ecosystem players such as like the uh, traders, financiers? So can you shed some light on your EMFN platform, MasterCard Farmer Network platform in uh, Kenya? Yeah, and, and, and Mo, actually, do you want to, do you mind, and I'm sorry to throw you right in here, I don't think Mo is expecting to be part of the answer to the question, um, but, but Mo has been working most closely with our uh, uh, MFN platform, and, and I think it take a couple of moments, Mo, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, uh, no problem, Laura. Uh, so the, the MasterCard Farmers Network, um, is a, a platform that, and although I'm, I'm not on the team and I, I'm speaking on their behalf, but based on working with them, uh, it's it's slightly different from the work that we're doing in New Consumers. Uh, they are a marketplace or a, a place that brings together buyers and sellers to help identify you know, the supply side and the demand side. And they also have, you know, a bunch of different modules in there that uh, can help with communications with farmers, for example. So they're really um, sort of like a platform that brings together all these players that you're talking about. So not only uh, is it bringing together the, the farmer and the agriculture producer, but they also have support modules for the actual off, off takers, the aggregators you're talking about, and the traders who help uh, perhaps transport and move the, the, the agricultural product, as well as connecting it, uh, connecting um, um, by biodata to issuers of credit like you, you saw in the presentation. So. The, the MFN network, our platform really is, is, a, is, a, is that kind of a platform that brings all those different players, not just the farmer and the buyer, but also the, the aggregators and uh, perhaps even the farm, uh, farmer associations that are in the, the value chain to help move a product from farm to market. And that's the, the, the short, <laughs> short answer, but that's how the, the support is provided um, in, in that case. In our new consumers work, we uh, work directly with the agribusiness who have their own traders um, and then the aggregators if they're third-party aggregators in the market we haven't quite gotten to that level yet. Thanks Mohammed. Uh, that is, uh, that is uh, quite helpful. Um, so I have another question uh, from Adams. Uh, uh, Adams is asking that like how MasterCard is helping uh, you to enroll in this uh, uh, in these kind of programs. 
So uh, the, within the two, and I'll speak on behalf of both the Nestor Guard Farmers Network as well as on behalf of the uh, supply chain, chain digitization work that we're doing. So uh, I'll start with supply chain. Um, the way we access the supply chain and actually access the individual farmers starts by developing a private sector partnership with those commodities players. Um, we've got partnerships either fully in place and underway or under development with folks like uh, the Norman Coffee Group, one of the largest uh, coffee uh, brokers in the world. With uh, We work with Ecom, uh, we are uh, working with PepsiCo, um, and through those relationships, uh, they identify the specific market or and or region that they would like us to begin and reach out to. And so we have started, uh, we've got programs uh, live and up and running are under development or underway in places like uh, uh, Veracruz in Mexico, in places like uh, Colombia and in Picolito. Um, we are working across Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and through that direct partnership, we are given access into the supply chain and access directly into the farmer community. And so that allows us, we start every one of our projects by in fact going into the market, into the farming communities directly. And what we will do, we generally spend a, a week as an example, doing uh, an in-market diagnostic where we'll actually spend time with the farmers themselves. We'll spend time with the cooperatives in the region. We'll spend time and understand who are the banking partners in the region. Who are the merchants that the farmers actually trade with and can they leverage their digital tools there? Can they access cash through their digital tools or do we need to build out an increased acceptance ecosystem? And then going back to the partnerships with the NGOs, we leverage those folks who in fact have larger armies of feet on the ground that can in fact develop one-on-one -on -one relationships and go out and do that individual and personalized training. So gaining that access to those folks is very, very much inherent on the strength and importance of the private sector partners that we have built into the program from the get-go. So defining who the right players are and establishing the right sort of rules of engagement for those coalitions and those, and, and those partners is a, is a key and essential item to success um, in the long term. Uh, thanks, Laura. So uh, I got another question from uh, Yelikana, Yelikana from uh, Oiko Credit. So it is, uh, the question is that taking the opposite direction, right? Like, uh, what do you do? Because uh, there are many uh, older people are like uh, not young people, but old people are in, uh, in Africa in agriculture. So do you do any um, uh, special uh, initiatives to reduce the digital divide, such as like maybe uh, U UX, UI, uh, in terms of designing your um, applications so that like uh, the digital divide is reduced? Yeah, so, so it's a very good question. And the user experience, the consumer experience, um, and the interface are really essential to everything that we do. And, and again, let, let's drill it back. You know, we know that we go into these programs where we need to sort of start with the least common denominator. So we, we go into these programs knowing that the level of sophistication and, and knowledge and usage of, of the farmers um, is, you know, not sophisticated. Um, just to use it, you know, if we design a program that is delivered digitally through a mobile application of some sort, you know, we know and we do a lot of research to actually identify and know specifically what percentage of the farmers have no phone, what percentage of the farmers have a smartphone, what percentage of the farmers still have an old flip phone, who is technically savvy enough in using WhatsApp, and you know, I think we've learned across the globe that WhatsApp, you know, has really taken off in these small the farmer communities as a way for them to communicate. Um, but then we also have to know and identify, you know, and understand what is in fact the level of uh, internet connectivity that these farmers have. You know, do they have Wi-Fi access? Do they have it in their home? Do they have to get it through some other family member? Is it sporadic? Is it so 
understanding first and foremost the, the ecosystem foundation is essential because if we, for example, just design the program and push you know a digital solution out there that only works on an Apple-based smartphone, and we find out you know that the 50 percent of the community has an Android-based device and the other 50 percent of the community has a flip phone, then you know we're, we're dead in the water. It's not going to fly. It's not going to work from the get-go. So building that CX, that UX, that interface based on what we know are not only the needs, but the understanding of the local market is absolutely essential to everything that we do. And, you know, I'm sure that Daniela would say the same thing coming at it from a mobile network operator, that, that user experience um, and creating as intuitive and easy experience as we can is really essential. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, asking uh, the questions. Uh, we still have, uh, uh, I think, one more question, but uh, probably, I mean, like, uh, the, we ran out of time. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your time and the interest in participating uh, with us. Uh, special thanks to Laura, um, and uh, everyone have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay, and um, thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Bye.